Stay tuned for Butler on Business, coming up next on the Liberty Express. Okay, welcome back to Butler on Business. My name is Alan Butler. Jimbo, would you please introduce our guest? Thanks, Alan. Our next guest is Leo Lindbeck. In 1995, Jack Trotter, Bob McNair, and Leo Lindbeck were having lunch in Houston, Texas. Mr. Trotter, who has since passed away, was a CPA and an attorney who had completed his assistance tax filings and was alarmed at how much was owed in taxes, a dilemma faced by millions of Americans every year. He discussed his concern with his friends over lunch. They decided that even though they were just ordinary citizens, they had to do something about the problem, and so was born the fair tax movement. Today, we are fortunate to have as our guest Mr. Leo Lindbeck, the Senior Chairman of Americans for Fair Taxation. Before we begin, I want our listeners to know that advocating for fair tax is only one of the many hats that Mr. Lindbeck wears. He also continues to serve as the Senior Chairman of Akinas Corporation, a holding company for the Lindbeck Corporation in Houston, a major commercial construction company originally founded by his father, later run by Mr. Lindbeck, and now run by his son. Mr. Lenbeck continues to serve as a life director for the Associated General Contractors of America, is corporate director for Duke Energy Corporation, and never one to shy away from a tough fight, is serving as senior chairman of Texans for Lawsuit Reform. Mr. Lenbeck, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for being on our show today. Well, I'll Glad tell you to what. Be here. You can tell he's from Texas. He's got that Texas accent, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> I'd but, be you disappointed know, if I didn't. <laughs> well, you know, whenever I go to New York, they ask me if I'm from Texas, and I look at them and tell them, hell no, I'm from Georgia. <laughs> but, well, it's still a compliment, and I would accept it. Oh, I accept the compliment. <laughs> And, you know, they're always nice to me. If you've got a fellow with a southern accent wearing a New York Yankees hat up there, they, they, they love you to death. <laughs> well, Leo, to begin with, how would you characterize our current tax system, and why do you feel there's a need for a tax system reform in the United States? I, I think that the, the easy answer is uh, when you tax production, as our current system does, uh, you're uh, frustrating the ability of the economy uh, to be productive. And where you take away the nutrients that uh, that really are needed in the, the economy uh, for further growth and substitute, uh, if you want to say, a metaphor of a, a, me- a mechanical approach where you pram the pump uh, the engine of growth, all of those are words that describe, in metaphorical terms, uh, the the economy as a machine. Uh, One of the principal problems is, at least I've never seen a machine that grows. And unless we have growth from which there is job creation and uh, following which there is a dynamic effect and interactive effect, uh, that creates almost a biological uh, or ecological, if you will, uh, a growth uh, direction for the country and the attendant job creation. And uh, we think that it would be optimal, and that's not only an intuition, but also uh, uh, what we've learned from the market and academic research that has been done, uh, that you just have too many uh, exceptions and exclusions from the current system, thereby uh, uh, diminishing the base, and there, it's a zero-sum game. And the uh, only way I can uh, uh, benefit is if, at the will of the government, uh, they take something from you and give it to me, uh, or vice versa. And so that's uh, that's what I, we think is the principal uh, adverse effect of the income payroll tax. Leo, I worked for the Reagan administration, and uh, I was always a big supporter of uh, the flat tax that Jack Kemp and uh, Senator Roth were pushing back in those days. Mm-hmm. It seemed like it was a very fair and a very simple tax system that a fourth grader could could, could do if they knew how to multiply uh, why do you feel like the fair tax in general would be better than, say, a flat tax? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we had a relatively flat tax in the 86 Act, 
And as long as you have available the income payroll tax system that we have, the special interests are going to be influencing the definition of income, uh, both on a credit and a debit side, uh, such that you very quickly degenerate into something that is highly complex. And therefore, we think you have to get rid of the source of the problem, not just the uh, the results of the problem. Well, uh, second, excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, secondly, uh, the the flat tax does not get rid of the payroll tax, FICA. And as you know, uh, at least seventy percent of the people in the country are wage earners. And as a result, uh, I think somewhere around 60% of that, uh, the payroll tax is the biggest tax they pay as the uh, complexity of the income tax system is manipulated to take uh, more and more people off of the income tax rolls and, and push the, uh, the baseline numbers to higher income levels. Uh, it, it leaves the people that work for wages paying the biggest tax through the payroll tax. And we think that's a problem in the country because if 70% of the people work for wages, it's very difficult to forge a consensus that is not a partisan effort, but rather a unifying effort on the part of the, the political class. Mr. Limbeck, there are other things that I like about a consumption tax, too, is it takes a lot of this underworld economy that we've got and brings the taxes into play. Well, there's no question about it having uh, a, an impact on the uh, underground or off-the-books economy. Uh, it, it's very difficult because of the nature of that economy to get uh, accurate data on the this scope of that particular activity, but it appears to be very substantial, and I've heard estimates from a trillion dollars to three trillion dollars uh, that is is believed to be uh, part of an underground economy. Well, getting into the nuts and bolts of the fair tax, could you please explain to our listeners exactly how it works? Is it a consumption tax? I mean, what is the difference? It's a pure cons. Uh, consumption tax. In other words, uh, you eliminate first all of the taxes based on income that arise out of the 16th Amendment. That begins with uh, personal income tax and extends to capital gain, uh, business tax, self-employment tax, death tax, uh, alternative minimum tax. All of those go away. And the revenue uh, generated by that existing system is replaced by tax on final consumption. It occurs one time at the point at which the final transaction occurs, a terminal transaction. Uh, it doesn't tax used products in that you're only taxed once when you purchase a, a, a product. And there are no exceptions and no exclusions so that you use the entire consumption base as the foundation for the tax. Leo, would that be basically at the retail level? Let's say I was in the manufacturing business and I was using steel as a, as a base material. I was buying corrugated for my packaging and, and things like that. Would those, at what point, how do you delineate, for example, banding material to band the finished product to a pallet? or the shrink wrap? I mean, how do you distinguish if it was truly at the end of the consumption line? Well, you observe the nature of the product and the uh, channels of distribution through which it gets to the market, and you only apply the tax at that final retail level. There is no business-to-business -business tax. There uh, is no value-added tax, which has been discussed to some extent here recently. Uh, so if you, if you buy something that can be consumed in its final form that you purchase it in and you, you buy groceries or, uh, you buy an automobile, 
you, you pay a tax on that retail purchase. And uh, you pay it one time, and uh, it's very, very simple uh, to, to shorthand it. Uh, every retailer in the country, uh, in effect, takes their uh, revenue that is generated from sales and deducts 23% of that and remits it to the state, which administers the, the fair tax. And for that service, the retailer gets 25 basis points of payment. The state then uh, takes the, the revenue uh, that arises out of the retail sale, uh, the the tax component of it. They keep 25 basis points and remit the balance of it to the U.S. Treasury. So the only ones that uh, act as bookkeepers are collectors for the tax or retailers. In addition, there's a prebate. The prebate is to uh, achieve the objective that the market research indicates is, is required by the people, namely that nobody will pay tax on the amount of essential goods and services they pay based on family size. Now, the way that is handled is at the beginning of each month, a, ch a check is distributed through the Social Security system to the individual family in an amount equal to one-twelfth of the, the tax that would be collected prospectively against the uh, purchases of a, of a family of four that buys their essential goods and services. A uh, quick question for you. In your opinion, what potential impact do you think the fair tax would have on the current deficit situation that they're debating right now? Do you think we would increase revenue under the fair tax? Or well, the way, it, uh, the way the bill has been uh, drafted, it's revenue neutral. Uh, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't do anything other than replace the revenue that is currently required or currently collected under the income payroll tax system. But if one removed that, uh, we've tested it uh, from an economic point of view. And for example, if you didn't have that revenue neutral uh, provision in the bill and let it at 23% produce what it'll produce, of even greater importance though, which applies no matter what you do with the revenue neutrality issue is that it frees up from the economy about 400, over $400 billion in compliance costs, uh, which is a, a, a frictional cost on the economy that would disappear. And that money is then available to be used for productive activity rather than uh, the compliance uh, costs that have, it is currently applied to. So we think that uh, to, to do an effective job of controlling spending and of dealing with the deficit, one needs a foundation of a tax system uh, that has the attributes of the fair tax. It's transparent. Uh, it's got a single rate that everybody can see and understand. It's, it's shown to them every time they make a retail purchase. Uh, therefore, there's a community of interest among all the taxpayers to be uh, vigilant in be making sure that the spending is as close to being productive as they can influence it to be. But and so that's, that's how we see it playing into the, the current argument. Mr. Limbeck, do you think there is, well, I mean, the, the only thing our politicians seem to be able to agree on is <clears throat> their automatic salary increase. Is there a prayer of a chance of getting this legislation passed? Well, it'll only get passed if the, the people insist that their elected representative uh, support the fair tax or else the, the their constituents will find somebody from their district who will. Uh, that's the ultimate control uh, 
over the the system that the sovereign citizen has if they if they uh, use that sovereignty uh, in a constructive way and control to a greater extent the behavior of the person they send to representative represent them then it will pass uh, very quickly well what does your research show for the average american middle class person out there who's working, does your research show that the taxes would stay the same or go down for the average individual? The rate would go down. Uh, if in, in our, On our website, there are tables that illustrate that uh, for each income uh, cohort, uh, but it starts with the premise that uh, through the re- prebate, nobody pays tax on essential goods and services. Now, that means more to a per, poor person than it does to Bill Gates. Uh, it's not even a rounding number for a wealthy person. But it's a, it's a principle that's important that the government ha- doesn't have the right going forward to impose a tax on those items of goods and services that a family needs uh, to support themselves. And uh, the tax then is all discretionary above that. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that prebate? Does everybody get the prebate? Everybody gets it. There's no means testing. But the net effect is that, as I just said, the, uh, the, the tax is progressive in terms of its impact on the income cohort of which the people are a part. Uh, so it, it it's it untaxes the poor, and it is a very minor uh, decline in taxes to the people at the highest income level, and for the middle of the pack, it uh, cuts their rate by almost half. Uh, so it's a, it's a tax that is visible and very understandable to each income group and their purchasing power goes up because uh, they their gross pay is their net pay and all of the control rests with the individual as to what and when they buy and therefore how much tax they pay i think it's a great plan now would the prebate be you said twelve thousand for a family of four so i assume it's three thousand dollars per person uh, well, it's it's uh, it's more for uh, an, an adult than it is for uh, a child. So, a family of four, I believe the the uh, essential goods and services number is about twenty two thousand dollars a year to buy essential goods and services. So, twenty three percent of that, uh, let's say roughly five thousand dollars a year. Uh, would be considered the impact that the, the fair tax would have on the purchases that were made. So at the beginning of each month, that family of four would get a check, which is their money in advance, that they will then use to pay the, the, uh, the tax on the essential goods and services they buy in that uh, month. And... Uh, If you have eight children, it's correspondingly higher. If it's a single person, it's uh, determined just by the one adult in that family. Mr. Limbeck, what can we do to help promote the fair tax? I think principally to propagate the information about it, to call it to people's attention, uh, to let them know that they do not have to be serfs, that they can act as sovereigns, and uh, the most uh, universal intersection of government with the people is the tax system. Uh, now, spending is extremely important, but we're of the opinion that uh, although we're not in the spending business, uh, we can't help but observe that when people know exactly what it's costing them, they take a higher level of interest in what is spent. And uh, we think this is the building block the foundation, if you will, for uh, the, the, the sovereign to have much more interest in and play a role in determining what the spending level will be. 
Mr. Lindbeck, I certainly appreciate your time. I hope you will agree to come on again in the future. Anytime you'd like. All right. Thank you very much.